Thank you, Millie. Good morning, Grace. It is a delight to be back with you after a week plus in Texas, and I thought I was going down to hot and humid, but guess what was here when I got back? <laughs> Blessings to all, and uh, prayers for those who may be finding discomfort and hardship in the midst of that. Um, Reverend Mary and I were checking in, and she said, yeah, my air conditioning went out, and the guy can't be here until Friday, and that was like Tuesday. And I said, yes, and our, our ceiling fan in our bedroom, we don't know how it happened, but at some point it started going in the reverse direction, so it was pushing the air up instead of pushing <laughs> First world problems, as we said, right? But uh, hope that you all are drinking water and resting well and taking care of yourself. Welcome to Denver Grace United Methodist Church. My name is Kama Hamilton Morton. I'm the senior pastor. We welcome you whether you are here in the room or watching online. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Denver Grace UMC. Uh, we ask uh, whether you're here or online if you get on Facebook and like our page and if you have YouTube to get on our uh, our page and to click that subscribe button and the bell icon that means you'll be notified when new videos are uploaded it also helps other people who may be looking for us online when there's more subscribers we love when you participate by saying hello or comment or respond to something in the service we welcome you to join us in person here at grace sundays at 10 a.m you can go to our website to see current protocols and check back as we're going to be leaning into things that we might tweak um, through the summer as we are all engaging in what do we do now to be together safely and comfortably and welcoming. We offer online worship as well, which is uploaded to Facebook and YouTube uh, after Sunday morning sometime. Today we welcome Millie Thomas as our guest musician this morning. Thank you, Millie, for coming back. And we uh, give thanks as Anita is in Florida with her kids and grandkids. We also welcome uh, Craig Nippenberg, our neighbor next to the church here at the Commons with the therapy groups uh, that uh, Craig will be joining us. Normally, Craig will usually, will often preach in June while the pastors are away at annual conference. But this year, our annual conference is postponed till October, so I thought it would be great to have him come anyway <laughs> and to share a good word for us as all of us continue to come out of COVID and wonder what, how we can tend to ourselves. Well, this morning, friends, people around the Northern Hemisphere, all over the world, are celebrating the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, when day and night are of equal length. And so we point out, from the back, we have spring, our spring window, and then the second window is our summer window. So we invite you to take a look at that as we appreciate our beautiful stained glass. Also today, our nation lifts up Father's Day, which may be a joyful celebration for many of you and your families, or it might be a complicated celebration, or even for some, a painful day. Wherever you are, may we honor our lives and relationships as we consider those who have fathered us, whether of blood or other relation or of choice. Our nation also this week lifts up Juneteenth, our newest federal holiday, but I found Nine News had an article and reminded us that Juneteenth has been celebrated in Colorado for decades, commemorating June 19, 1865, when Union soldiers brought the news of freedom to enslaved Black people in Galveston, Texas, two months after the Confederacy had surrendered and about two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So I encourage us to not just take this as a holiday of sales and celebration, but especially for those of us, myself, who identify as white, um, as a time to learn, to listen, to read, to inquire, to dig into our history and the systems that continue to cause harm or unequal access. 
We begin this morning by singing a beloved song, How Firm a Foundation in our United Methodist Hymnal, number 529. And these lyrics hearken to numerous scripture texts and give us a sense of encouragement and hardship. And I picked this out before I knew it was going to be Juneteenth weekend, but a number of years ago, I attended Isla Week of Lectures at the Iowa School of Theology, and one of the presenters was our first African-American female bishop in the United Methodist Church, Leontine Kelly, and she concluded a sermon by saying and proclaiming the words of this hymn as she came out of the pulpit and down amongst us with fervor and from memory. So we invite you to sing or to say or to hum the words of this powerful hymn uh, that are in your bulletin. Let us worship together. So um, you might think if you have anything that you're 
dads tell you, or even if there's people out here that um, think of things that maybe your dad taught you, that still sticks with you. Anyone have anything to share? Everything. Oh, we've got in everything up here. <laughs> well, I know one of my dad's favorite sayings, and I still believe it's true, especially driving in Denver. Uh, you've got to drive for yourself and to everybody else. <laughs> and it really is true. He must have known that I was going to live in traffic. <laughs> Any, anything else coming to mind? I, I was listening to Caleb radio station yesterday and they were having a lot of dad advice. People were calling in with things that their dads had, had said to them. And there was one of one lady said that her dad said, you better pick up your lower lip before you step on it. She remembered that. <laughs> and then there was another one that was really good. And I don't know if you'll be able to hear it so well with my mask on, but I'll try. One father said, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talk talks louder than your talk talks. <laughs> so yeah, so if you can connect the dots in that one, that's a good one. So we really give thanks today for our fathers and all the wisdom that they have given us. And we know that our Heavenly Father has given us much wisdom, too, in the Bible. The Bible that is such a wonderful guide for our lives. And he sent us Jesus to even learn more for, about God and his ways. And I wanted to share a passage today from Matthew. Uh, it's from Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. And it talks about parents and then relates it to our Heavenly Father. A good message for us today. You parents, if your child asks for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him. So just think about that. As much as our dads do for us and love us, God does for us and loves us even more. What a blessing. What a wonderful blessing. So today's prayer, I'm going to start the prayer, but then I'm going to just let you have a time of a silent prayer, maybe a thanks for your father or anything else that's on your heart. And you can certainly join in in your own hearts as well. And then I'll say amen when we're done. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. And we thank you for the gift of fathers on this earth. Amen. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much. Janice, that uh, reminds us all of the people in our lives who have been fathering and of the comic strips that talk about fathering. <laughs> Today, we're going to hear a scripture from the Gospel of Mark that talks about Jesus um, caring for us and caring for himself. From Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Jesus stills a storm. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat against the boat and into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus 
was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Here ends our reading. I washed, walked around, and like any kid, I washed what I saw. 
And I told my dad I was done, and he came out, and he, he pointed down at the quarter panels underneath, all around the car, that I didn't see. And he said, son, if you're going to do a job, don't do it half-assed. <laughs> and I learned that lesson. That, that was a big one that stuck with me my whole life. Now, at the same time, we are telling kids what to do and how to live and how to be more successful and follow these things, this path that we want you to follow. It's critical that children know that they're loved and also that you are proud of them. If I had to pick an alternative text, the pastor offered me the chance to preach on another text, I said, no, I'll stick with this one, but it would be the great blessing. In that moment when God says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, God bless Jesus. In Hebrew, they have a feeling for this, that God was feeling. The word is nakas, and nakas means to have pride in one's offspring. And, and God felt that pride. Now, many times in life, we don't bless our children to their older, just like Jesus. He had, he had worked hard for years. He was in his 30s when he was blessed. I was privileged to be blessed by my father about a year before he passed away. But in blessing your kids is something we need to do every day. And not just dads, but moms and women too. They need our blessing to know that you're proud of them. When you don't do that and wait, the consequences are painful. I've worked with several men who lost their children or teens to, in accidents or death by suicide. And in working with them in their grief, the emotion of, I never got to tell them how proud I was. About two weeks ago, I'm working with a young man, a college student, who lost his father tragically to a heart attack when he was in middle school. And I was asking him about his relationship with his dad. And he said, you know, when I was younger, we had this great relationship. Uh, my dad, he, dad was a, a college hockey player, a lacrosse player. He had three sons that he taught hockey and lacrosse. He coached their teams. And then he said, and then about middle school, I was kind of losing interest. And I started playing a lot of video games. Now, to say that our kids have played a lot of video games over the last year and a half would be a major understatement. That's pretty much what they've been doing. Uh, but he said, I started playing video games, and my dad was always saying to me, you know, if you spent more time doing your sports like you do the video game, you'd be the top player on the team. And then he looked at me, and he said, now that my dad's died, Dad, I don't know if he was proud to have me as his son. And if he could see me now. Since then, like all young teens, he gave up the video games. He got into bodybuilding, weightlifting, got into boxing, and was an incredible athlete. And I was able to bless him to say, I knew your dad, and he was proud of you, and he would be proud of you. So, never miss an opportunity to share Nakas with the children and teens uh, in your lives. It's essential. Now, turning to our passage today uh, from Mark. The disciples feared for their lives. Jesus calmed the storms. Hopefully, the, the storms of COVID, we're hoping are ending now. And there won't be a resurgence, but we're seeing the winds of COVID calm down. He then challenges them and he's about their fear of death. Why are they afraid? Now, we were all afraid during COVID of death, that it's very basic about death. I work at St. Anne's Episcopal School where I'm the consultant, mental health consultant. And when COVID first started, we heard the news that it was you know, coming around the world. And I would meet with the classes and talk to the students about, you know, children don't need to be afraid of this. You don't have to worry about yourself, right? Which was really helpful for the kids. But on, I believe it was March 15th, our school, we had to clear the entire school because we had the first case in Colorado. It was about the second or third case in Colorado, but first in Denver uh, of one of our parents. And Children's Hospital talked to our head of school and said, send all the kids home. And we gathered the students up and we announced that they were gonna be going home. And this little second, third grade girl was crying, very hysterical, and I comforted her and I said, now you know, honey, you don't need to worry for yourself. You're gonna be just fine. Who do you think she was crying about? 
their grandparents. She said, I, don't, I know I don't need to worry about myself, but my grandparents are in Mexico. What if they get it? Kids were afraid for their parents and for their grandparents. Grandparents were afraid for their own kids, for their own families. Or of not seeing each other again. We didn't get to see my mom for quite some time. We finally got to see her on Mother's Day this year, which was a real delight. But we feared loss. Now, thankfully, we have a foundation, just as we sign up. So the Im image I like to use in therapy is if you're standing on a mound of sand by the ocean, and you're sitting there, and the winds are calm, it's beautiful, but all of a sudden the winds pick up, and the storm rages, and the waves come ashore. This horrendous storm hits you. If you're standing on the sand, what happens to you? Whoop, you go down. What do you need? You need a rock. You need, you need a foundation to stand on. Now, thankfully, with Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the rock. We have a foundation to stand on to endure anything in life, including COVID-19. But it doesn't mean, however, that you're going to not get wet or you're not going to feel the wind. You're going to have the same emotions and reactions that the disciples had, that all of us, the, the normal human emotions, the fear, the anxiety, the anger, the sadness, the loss, all of those things we've been hit with over these, this last year and a half. As such, as the winds have calmed down, we're now entering what I call the P in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And our hospitals, our therapists around town, around this country, around the world, are overwhelmed with children, teens, adults, older people who are really struggling emotion. And there's reasons that that hits. And we knew this was going to come. Children's Hospital announced a, a, a statewide emergency for mental health for children and teens. They have to put the teens who have come in feeling suicidal, they're having to put in regular medical beds. There's not enough room in the mental health care facilities. We, we had a parent call us the other day, and she said, I've called five, reached out to five therapists. You're the only one that called us back. One of them left a message saying if we paid up front, he'd call us. I'm like, and parents are desperate, looking for help for their children and teens. Now, there's reasons why this post-traumatic stress happens. So, a quick neurology lesson. If you've heard of your amygdala, which is a little almond-sized piece of your brain, it's your alarm system uh, for, your, for your safety. And when it goes off, it tells you to do Three things, one of three things, fight, run, flee, or freeze. So if right now, I saw Nathan early, earlier, if Nathan came running in and he said, there's a tiger out in, this, in the North X, our amygdalas would go off, right? We would have this sudden rush of pain. When that happens, your, your brain fills your body with cortisol. And cortisol is a stress hormone. And it sends all of your oxygen out to your arms and your legs, and your heart beats fast, and your lungs trying to take in oxygen so you can do one of those three things. Now, let's say the, 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 the tiger was gone, the zookeeper came over and apologized and said, sorry, you got out, uh, but we'll take it back now. Uh, we would all calm down. Do you think we'd remember what happened? The memories of what happened would stick with us for about two hours. The brain would etch every experience, the, everything you just experienced into your brain. It's the reason why I was only five, but I can remember my mom crying before the TV set when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I have that memory etched deeply in my brain, and that was from the cortisol. Now, cortisol is designed for short-term crises not necessarily long term. This has been a long, long, long term crisis, a long trauma. All of us have had sustained cortisol levels this entire time. Cortisol, cortisol takes a toll on your heart, your lungs, your physical health, and your mental health. And if you think about one experience takes two hours to get over, we've got a year and a half 
to try to kind of recover from and process. And that is going to take time. My guess is it's about a year and a half before, if it doesn't come back, we got a good year and a half of just trying to recover from everything we've experienced. In addition, this trauma was our, the way we had to respond to it is unnatural for our brains. The, at the foundation of our brain design, and I published a book since I was last here, by the way, it's called Wired and Connected, and it's about how our brains are designed to connect with each other, to live in communities. We know that humans survive in communities, and being with others is essential to our mental health. Well, now we ask children to stay away from each other. What do children want to do? They, they want to hug and, and do each other's hair and play chase and tag. And being in a school this year where we had to have all the kids sit six feet apart and line up six feet apart and in a recess not touch each other. I had a little second grade boy who got in trouble and he had to come see me and I asked him, well, what happened? He said, well, I picked up a stick and I swung it at one of the other kids. And I said, well, why'd you do that? He said, well, we were, since we can't play tag, we've been grabbing little sticks and we touch each other with a stick. And I said, okay. And then he said, well, I saw this big branch and I thought I could really help my team if I had a bigger branch. Now I said to him, that's really smart. That's a great idea, but probably not appropriate on the playground. And he looked at me and he said, well, I don't have to worry about it now because I'm, when I'm outside and I run around at recess, I run around like this, so I won't touch anyone. How sad is that? Teenagers. When World War II happened, any war we've been in, young people, what are we asking them to do? Go out, join the military, band with your brothers and sisters, fight. That is what the teen brain is designed to do. Teenagers are hopped up on emotions. How many of you have parented a teenager? <laughs> I got one sitting here. There are times when your teenager will say to you, you don't understand how I feel. And guess what? You don't. Because your brain can't produce that much emotion anymore. But it could when you were a teenager. Their emotional brains are twice as active as children and adults. They're risk takers. Now, sadly, we see on Monday mornings, you read in the newspaper about all the stupid things teenagers did over the weekend while they were driving or whatever. But in war, do you need to be risk takers? To protect a tribe, you have to be willing to take risks. Those are teenagers. That's what they're programmed to do and to fall in love and be with their friends and hang out all day. With this battle, we said, oh no, this is how you fight. You stay home with your parents. You wear a mask. You don't go out with your friends. That's it. How many of you could handle that for a year and a half? Brutal at that age. And that's why they're struggling so much now. They lost a year and a half of the developmental things they were supposed to be doing. Now, when it all first started, we went into quarantine. We all thought it was gonna be two weeks and our sweet daughter here said to us, Great, I get to be stuck at home with you two for the next two weeks. And we were like, yeah, we know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then two weeks turned to two months and six months and a year. She finally got to go to some classes at TJ, but not very much. Alone with us, just like all the other teachers, uh, teenagers and kids with their families. Now at first, many families love that and working at home, being around your kids. But over time, it took a toll. Because to be honest, our ancient ancestors, our brains weren't designed to spend this much time with your family. You would be off hunting, you'd be off gathering, you'd be living with others in the community, not just all stuck together. On the other extreme would be someone like my mother who was quarantined, her neighbor got it at her retirement community. She had a quarantine for two weeks. For six or seven months, she had to take all of her meals in her room. She couldn't join her, her friends. She couldn't play poker with her three lady friends that she plays every day. She just had to be isolated and alone. That takes a tremendous toll on one's mental health. 
And thirdly, before I get to some tips, this was a pretty surreal experience. We haven't had to deal with something like this in the last 100 years, since 1918. None of us had a frame of reference for this, a way to understand what was going on. Our brains are used to patterns of things we experience over and over again, and we know what to do. This was a whole new thing, and it was indeed surreal. It was a strange experience. Now, when we were in it, your cortisol levels are high, you, you're trying to fight as best you can to survive and, and suffer through the food insecurity that millions of Americans have, loss of, of jobs, loss of homes, all the things that changed required great stamina. Think of yourself on that rock. The waves have come ashore, you survived it, now the winds have come, the winds have calmed down. And, and you're standing on that rock. Well, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna start looking around, and you're gonna see what the damage is. You're gonna look at, those buildings are gone. My friends over there are gone. They didn't make it. After a trauma, after the winds have come, you start to assess what are our losses. So there's 600,000 funerals in this country that are gonna to have to take place because people didn't get to mourn together. Our brains are wired to be together, to share our emotions with each other. There's gonna be countless weddings where the bride and groom are gonna be thrilled to finally have their wedding and the ceremony, maybe not the ceremony they dreamed of or wanted, but they're gonna notice who's not there, who didn't make it, right? Teenagers, the loss of their graduations, the loss of their first job, maybe. All the, the family reunions that we had to cancel. After a trauma, you start to count your losses. And that's what all of us are doing now. It's an essential process. And one you have to do in order to put this experience into the history of our lives. So COVID, like anything else, becomes part of our history, but it needs to be processed. I really like the idea of just sharing. And that's what we do all day. All day we share emotions with people and help them process it. And you should be turning to each other or pastor as a community, talking about your experiences and what you lost and what your fears were. To process those emotions. Maybe you like to write. Maybe you like to journal. I encouraged one teenage girl the other day who was an artist to, to, to make some paintings of what she experienced. I also like the idea of rituals, uh, things that you do. If, in my office over here, I have the upstairs room with windows that look out at the mountains and a beautiful fireplace. And I have a collection of crosses and different memories from tough experiences. And I have a beautiful stained glass window of Columbine flower from my experience at Columbine High School. And I was talking to this, this little second grader. I said, you know, I'm going to take my mask and I'm going to hang them up. So that when this is all over, we don't need more, I'm gonna hang my mask up on my, my wall there because that's where I keep things from my past. And a little boy looked at me and he said, I'm gonna burn mine. <laughs> <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> Go for it, just ask your parents permission first. Um, now, the Bible tells us there's a time to mourn, there's also a time to celebrate. And as we move forward, this is a time to start to celebrate, to reconnect by being in worship together, by talking our emotions out and looking forward to our hopes and our dreams. I have a podcast for, for parents um, called Legit Parenting. And one of the things I talked about in one of the episodes was, you know, it's good to have a lost jar and a hope jar. And the lost jar, you sit down and you talk about what are the things we lost, we'll put them in the jar. And you talk about things you're hoping for, and you put that back in the jar. Could be seeing family. We got to visit my mom finally. Get involved in your pre-pandemic activities, which is essential for mental health, to get back into the life of the things you were doing. Uh, could be travel. There's lots of people traveling right now. Or simply the act of sharing a meal with each other. We need to focus on our hopes and to move forward. Now, 
As we're doing that, we need to rebuild. Fortunately, we have a foundation in Christ and that, that stills our own hearts. And now we need to take that, the stillness we feel, and share that with those around us. And it could be as simple as talking to your neighbor, checking on someone. How are you doing? How are you holding up? Asking an essential worker, how are you holding up? They, they've been through a lot. Often it's just validating our emotions, what they experience. It's just saying, I understand. It's normal to have that feeling. Getting back to maybe helping a neighbor who has to work and needs help with child care. Could be something like that. Getting back to some of your own charity work that you've been doing for years and years. It could also be contributing to food banks for those who face insecurity with food. Could be help with housing. Any number of things to get, help others get back on track. Or even donating to Children's Hospital. They've asked for donations to be able to support more and more kids. But this is the time for us to celebrate, to mourn, and to take action and to help rebuild our country. So I will end. I have no idea how long I've been talking for since I didn't have my timer on. Um, but I want to end with my favorite poem. And it's in my office over here. Life is short and pain is long. And we were put here for one thing, to help each other. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us uh, thank Craig for sharing with us this day. Good. I want to say welcome to Lisa and Lily with us too. Thank you for sharing Craig with us this morning. And to I want to say too, there was a little, I uh, didn't say anything before Craig started speaking, but thanks to our uh, New Life Praise team and uh, for as I, as I watched the recorded service from last week and had, we're starting to have some live music, which is, which is just a, a real gift. I invite us on these the words of wisdom and reflection uh, that Craig has brought us to take a deep breath and to in, invoke an attitude of prayer. This is in our American uh, culture. Father's Day is not a religious holiday, but it is a social and cultural time when we are invited to think of those people who have been fathers to us, uh, or have served or worked in fathering ways in our lives. And as you think about your life or those that you know, that may look in a variety of different ways. So I invite us just to pause and to bring to God some reflection and prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, on this Father's Day, may we turn our hearts and prayers to ourselves, to those who have served and worked and lived in fathering roles. For our fathers who have given us life and love, that we may show them respect and love, we pray to the Lord. For fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends support and console them, we pray to the Lord. For men, though without children of their own, who, like fathers, have nurtured and cared for us, we pray to the Lord. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families, we pray to the Lord. O oh God, whom some know and call you as Father, in your wisdom and love you made all things. Bless those who have fathered us in our lives. Grant that we, their children of blood or circumstance or choice, may honor them with the spirit of respect. 
We ask this through Christ our Lord. And as we breathe deep, I invite us to pause in silence as we lift those prayers which remain in the depths of our hearts. And now I invite you to lift your voices together with me, as printed in your bulletin, with the prayer Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For our telling the story in our offering time this morning, we remind you that uh, as you depart worship, we invite you, if you have a physical offering to share, or tithe or offering today, to, to just place it in the plates and they will be taken immediately um, to the locked uh, place for that to be to be taken care of. We do also remind everyone, and I believe it might be in your bulletin, the ways to give online. And you can go to our website, gracefordenver.org. There's an online giving button, um, which many of you are taking advantage of. But as far as telling our story, which we do each week as a part of reminding ourselves of who Grace is and what we are a part of and why we give of ourselves for the mission and ministry of Grace, um, just as a follow-up to conclude, the great thanks, uh, Mary last week talked about the diaper depot again, and she was able to connect with them. They, they picked up the diapers, the baby wipes, all of the supplies that you all had so generously been giving uh, throughout the month of May. And the magic number is you brought 3,095 diapers and pull-ups and 35 packs of baby wipes. So, thank you, Grace, for being, uh, being a missional church that gives beyond ourselves. They were so grateful and emphasized the ongoing and often dire need for those products, which can be so expensive for families. And so, watch, we may have periodic drives through the year, but in the meantime, I guess I would say, if you find a great sale on diapers or baby products we can bring them on into the church and we'll we'll just have a, a place as part of our other uh, ongoing missional collections and we'll celebrate and share those with the diaper depot so thank you grace for being the hands of jesus to our community we invite you to And so, with that, we're going to sing. And this song is, again, one of my favorites, Be Still My Soul, thinking about the story, which Craig referenced from Mark's Gospel, and the, and the uh, storm and the winds of our lives, which we are striving to come through. I have to say, um, I have a couple different kinds of masks. This one I can kind of pop up and down easily. And I've been hearing from people some people that I know, and some just kind of in articles or, or um, on TV or whatever, who are talking about uh, that we're going to keep our mask with us in case uh, we, we need. But And as, as we've been told, friendly Coloradans want to be um, able to use it in a, in a moment if asked to. But also, I don't know if you've seen that just this last week, a couple of articles saying, well, now that we're not wearing our masks, the summer colds are coming back. So, my hope and prayer is that even as we um, perhaps start to release in, in circumstances and watch for that in the church too, we'll be discerning how best to do that as we move forward, the, the requirements 
that we normalize that if we see one another with a mask, that it's just a part of being uh, careful for ourselves and for others. So uh, for those, as I've had a little congestion this week, I thought, oh boy, there it, there it is. <laughs> so be still, my soul. Let us take a breath. This is a prayerful song. This is to Finlandia, which one of another of our favorite songs, um, This Is My Song, is, is also a part uh, of that and we'll sing together. to serve 
uh, maybe for you or for someone you think of, as we adjust to some in-person gatherings as well, we are in need of all of us to, to pitch in, including our hospitality and welcome team, which re receives you and greets you and invites you to be a part of worship. Um, we're gonna be looking for folks to rotate to be a part of that and as that will be an ongoing part of our worship life together. To record worship, Miss Kathy yesterday has been up front recording a phone on a tripod. It's not hard, but there's a little bit. I, I would love for all of you this week to go onto YouTube and to look at one of the past services that we've had since June. This is our third one. And just to see what she does with uh, panning out or zooming in. It's not its not a, a real complicated thing, but it would be great to have a few folks who could be available from Sunday to Sunday to sit and be our recorder, as that will be a very important thing. And thirdly, as we think about possibly being able to, to use the screen in some fashion, um, that we would need somebody to sit over by our camera. Doug and I were in yesterday playing around trying to get the screen to lower. Oh my gosh, all the batteries of all three of the remotes were dead. So we had to <laughs> replace the projector and the screen and the camera. Uh, again, it will, be, uh, it will be using the camera live on the person up front so that if you're sitting in the back, if you need a closer up thing, as well as per perhaps showing some uh, recorded music. We've got some brace ringers and chimes and things in our uh, ready to show you all when we can get that going. But that would take another person. So if you know of someone who might be able to be a part of that. And last opportunity to serve is uh, our soundboard, which is currently up in the balcony. It would be great to have a, a few folks that could be trained with some of the basic, um, every microphone has a up and down mic and um, Craig, we had to turn Craig up because he's got a nice, a soothing voice and I have a booming voice and so, you know, the volume might be different on us. So those are the kinds of things as we think about how might all of us be a part and an opportunity to serve as we want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. But now it is time to go forth, beloved. So let us take a deep breath. We gather to worship, we depart to serve. Let us go from this place, this sanctuary, or this online service, that we may be evidence of Jesus on the start of this summer season, this Father's Day, this Juneteenth weekend. Receive the power and the action of a traditional benediction that I am loving and you may hear periodically. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.